Recording in progress.
Um, I think we would be if we can get the zoom up on the screen and we're good. I think we're just All waiting right, for I'll wait for your indication then and then turn my camera on. Okay, okay. Does that mean that we're ready? Room. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm turning it over to you. <laughs> Fantastic Thanks that we were able to be there in person. So um, today we're going to be speaking about infrastructure lights. Um, and we've got a number of panelists. I'll allow each to introduce themselves as we begin uh, to not take up too much time in what we're talking about um, when we talk about the stack, because we're going to be using that term quite a bit throughout this conversation. Most users, policymakers are familiar with all of the social media platforms that we use, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. But of course, those services don't make commerce depend on a wide, wide range of service providers, which include a number of things, which we call the stack. I, internet service providers support services such as Amazon Web Services, certificate authorities, payment processors, email, and so on and so forth, stack. The stack is, of course, a term borrowed from computer science and software engineering, um, but in this the basically the various players that make the modern web possible um and so find in infrastructure precisely today, because I think that this is still an open conversation for many of us. So I'm going to end the setting of the scene there and turn to my panelists. Um, today we have Corinne McSherry, Emma Lanzo, Augustina Del Campo, and in the room you have Mallory Knodel with you. Um, so let me just kick off. When we talk about infrastructure interventions, um, since that's what this panel is about, what exactly are we talking about? Whoever would like to take this, I think Corinne perhaps? Jillian, you are cruel. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's very early where you are. I'm sorry, should I, I can turn that one to someone else if you want to get warmed up. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. I, but I'll, I'll just give you an example of what we're talking about because it's a sample of why we worry about it. Um, 
infrastructure level interventions can include everything from you know internet shutdowns, which is a pretty dramatic example. Um, but one of the one of the things that we've seen the most is. Um, interventions that, at least at EFF, we think of as financial censorship type interventions. And these are interventions where payment processors, either on their own or under pressure from governments or, other, or even private parties, will um, stop processing payments for a particular organization. Uh, and that can be sort of mission critical, depending on what the organization is. If you're a nonprofit and you depend entirely on donations, if you know your payments aren't getting processed, that's it. You know you cannot exist anymore, and it's very difficult for you. And um, at my organization, we started paying attention to this. I think even 11 years ago. This is not a new phenomenon; it's just an accelerating one. But we started paying particular attention to it when um, when a Visa and Mastercard stopped processing payments for WikiLeaks under pressure from the United States government, as well as some private parties. Um, and this was in response to some of the work that WikiLeaks was doing and that, you know, particularly the US government wasn't happy about, still isn't happy about. Um, but one of the ways of pressuring them was to say, well, okay, well, you can't get funding anymore. And therefore really you can't exist anymore. Um, and that's a sort of basic kind of intervention that um, we've seen more and more. And I think at this point kind of accelerating um, um, around the world. Okay, let me follow that up with another question. Any of you are welcome to take this, just feel free to jump in. So we've got examples like WikiLeaks historically, and then we've also got a lot of examples around this that concern what many of us would think of as problematic actors. And yet at the same time, I mean, there's all over the world who are affected by this. So give us a little bit more, why should we be concerned about these content-based interventions beyond Yeah, I'm happy to jump in there. Um, my name is Emma Alonzo. I'm the director of the Free Expression Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. I'm based in Washington, DC, um, and wish I could be with you uh, all there at IGF in person. Um, so I think there are a lot of different, as Karin was saying, there are a lot of different kinds of intermediaries um, at, and technical infrastructure that might get invoked in doing content blocking. Um, one thing that we have seen uh, experimented with um, and pursued in different countries around the world, including in the US back in the, the mid 2000s, is IP address blocking or um, trying to leverage the domain name system to block access to websites. Um, so this is an idea of rather than going to the person who has created a website that might have illegal material on it, trying to go to other technical support that they absolutely depend on, you know, whatever domain name provider issues their domain name, um, whatever ISP assigns their IP address, um, and telling those intermediaries who really don't have that connection to the content, who don't know kind of either where it came from necessarily or have any context behind what may make it illegal or what may make it actually lawful and, and misunderstood in some context. Um, these intermediaries can really be a lot more sort of arm's length from the actual content at issue. And they often don't really have that many incentives to fight for the content. There is an overbroad request or a request that's really going beyond the boundaries of for intermediaries throughout the stack to just say, look, this content is causing us trouble. Um, it's problematic. We don't really know how to block it. We're just going to uh, interfere with people's access to it so that the people telling us that it's a place stop bothering us about it. Um, often any individual post or website um, really doesn't matter very suffer any negative business impacts. And on the other side, they face potentially significant reputational risks for can try to keep content online. Um, one example I can give um, actually from the United States, 2005, before my time at the organization, um, when uh, one of the states in the United States passed a law blocking orders and domain name blocking orders um, to ISPs, uh, and it was framed of online child safety and, um, and reducing and removing uh, child sexual abuse imagery from the procedure and the law was laudable and, and very understandable, but the technique that they were trying to use was incredibly overbroad. Um, and so in the court case of CDT versus Papert, um, we demonstrated that the kind of blocking that was allegedly, um, you know, websites that were hosting alleged child sexual abuse imagery, uh, but were also taking down everything from or the websites of small businesses like dentist office. There were the way that it was a technique that was very difficult to tailor to one particular 
uh, web. So um, that's an, just one illustration of how some of these technical intervention measures can really be impact on kind of other speech that gets swept up in these uh, approaches can be pretty a lot about the technique here. Um, are there other examples that anyone else would like to bring up? Otherwise, I've got more questions for you. Feel free. Hi, everyone. Agustina del Campo here. I direct the Center for Studies on Freedom of Expression. We're a regional center um, based at Universidad de Palermo in Buenos Aires. Um, so good to be here and to be able to share with you this space. So there's I think I think there's a lot of examples and we can spend the entire day here just uh, mentioning different examples from around um, the world. I wanted to highlight was um, an issue that comes up in in many of them from the Latin American region, which is a lot of the times these measures um, are open. And because of where we intervene in, in the infrastructure stuff, a lot of examples, particularly when we think about payment processors, the only impact within the jurisdictions of a country or of a specific act outside of that jurisdiction. Um, and this is particularly relevant when we think about um, interventions that are that may be mandated by by courts or by different national authorities of different countries um, a lot of times we have these um, this decisions that are usually preliminary decisions before there's a decision on the on the final outcome of any case and they are taken to prevent damages um, and many times without realizing within that that the impact of the individual case and the individual measure adopted for the individual case will have far reaching um, very much beyond the borders of the municipality or the city or the province being taken. And the example that I can cite to you is um, decisions regarding Uber of uh, mandates to block payment processors um, linked to the company and was um, where there was a, a, a contention about the legality of the functioning of the um, different courts in different places around the region um, ordered payment processors to stop processing payments for these companies. So at the end of the day, um, credit cards from certain countries cannot be used for um, for these companies, even outside with a lot of collateral.
collateral effects, both both in terms of jurisdiction and in terms of um, uh, you know unintended consequences. Um, is there anything, or what can speakers or users do if they find themselves on the wrong side of a content intervention uh, on one of these these um, or with one of these companies or platforms? Are there any appeals processes available, or you know, is it? Yeah, what else? What else can you tell me there? <laughs> Um, yeah, I think I can speak to that because I think um, I think that's exactly the problem is that very often some of the people who are affected, they don't have an option. They, they may not have a relationship to um, the company that's doing the intervening at all. Um, so that's one problem. Also, depending on the service, the, the, the service in question may have very little reason or um, motivation to be careful. Um, or even to, or to have an appeals process. Um, another thing that can happen, um, which is why we worry about these things, is that sometimes things may just content may disappear from the internet, and users won't know that it's not there. You may not know what you don't know. You may not realize that like, something's been taken down and it's no longer available, because um, there isn't necessarily you know, a notice left behind um, to tell you like there used to be a website here and now there is not, and um, and it had X content. So it's sort of, I think the, in the, we were talking a little bit about how they can often be overbroad, overbroad these kinds of interventions. Um, and it's also that the, the, very often there isn't any obvious appeals process. So maybe you can appeal by making noise on social media and maybe the company will pay attention to you depending on whether you have power. But if you don't have power and um, and you don't have you know access to a, a sort of broad influence of some other kind, you don't have a ton of options um, in as a speaker, as a user, as an audience, as a person who wants to access content um, to be influential. Much less that you know as a speaker, but also as someone who who might be you know interested in in, in being an audience for for a speech. And so this is the reason why it's very worrisome. One other thing I wanted to flag is that we're using um, the term content intervention, and that's deliberate. Um, at the platform level, we talk a lot about content moderation, and usually we're to, what we're referring to there is that platforms, you know, can they they're not very good at moderating often either, and you know, make a lot of mistakes. Um, but they have relatively or comparatively precise tools for targeting particular speech. Sometimes the largest ones have appeals mechanisms. They're janky. They're inadequate. But they, ex um, but at the at other levels of the stack, the um, it's not really moderation. Have appeals processes. They just sort of intervene, and it's an on-off switch, um, which can make it very, very things that they make much more significant. And I should have said, by the way, my name's Corinne McSherry, and I'm with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. <laughs> Thank you, Corinne. No, that's an excellent point as well. And I do want to come back to something that I think Emma had mentioned, um, but I think we should come into all of this because I know when we're talking about content moderation, we've seen a lot of troubling interventions and um, content moderation platforms so social media more or less um we've seen a lot of troubling interventions in the past few years and i think we're going to be seeing a lot more but where do states stand, um and what can we what can we do there so i'm happy to chime in but i wasn't sure if augustina had wanted to come in on another point Oh, oh, sorry. I, if I missed a hand, I apologize. It was no, very don't worry. <laughs> Thanks, Emma. Yeah, it was very subtle. No, um, I just wanted to to dig a little further on the notice thing that Karine was mentioning, because um, a lot of a lot of the thinking around content intervention in 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 this um, other companies um, is usually thought of as like, like the problems that we see can usually be seen as easy to resolve, but they mo most often are not that easy to resolve. It's not a question of setting up an appeals process or setting up mandating a notice. Um, and related to what you were meant just now, um, many times what, what we've seen are 
stated all per se where the state mandates that there not be a notice. Uh, when we think about content moderation on, on any part, that intervention to, to other pieces of pages, entire sites just disappear and you don't know what you don't know. What you don't know is there uh, in any other alternative way so to resolve. And the, the second point is a lot of times you don't know and the There can be a lot of confusion. Um, one example that, that I've been sort of thinking about lately a lot is the, the there's a Colombian constitutional case um, that, is being, that is being argued before the, the Colombian constitutional court um, that deals with access to information. They're basically asking the a technology authority of the country to be clear, investigate and provide information as to who were the companies involved, what happened, what was the role of the state in content disappearing. Um, these were parallel to the Palestinian protests that the oversight board, content moderation being done in Instagram, you had problems of telcos and signal you had downs and there were a number of allegations related on different points so you have a number of different companies involved in this is precisely you should be able to investigate and tell us what bottom line there were allegations of censorship but people didn't know where to point them at. example of how in one given situation it can be really hard to see on or who is intervening when you have a number of different actors that you internet experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. I come in on that. And also the, the question that you'd asked about kind of the role of the law and, and there are, when we think about what, what might happen between a user posting comments, and any one of them might be intervening in some way and you know frankly no one's no one's doing it great even if we're thinking um so you end up in a situation where it can be a big mess and and as augustine is pointing out really difficult to understand action against speech that is in violation of your rights or for doing some kind of investigation or monitoring of your this is part of where we are often pushing for and trying to have more clarity on what's going to be really crucial to ultimately, you know, not just kind of figuring out what's going on in the minute, but uh, our, our legislatures should try to clarify what is and isn't acceptable for different kinds of... And another just thought on this whole question of, you know, uh, trying to understand this come from um, all of the debates that have happened worldwide around net neutrality in particular, and SPs in particular ever be allowed to do content blocking or filtering or serve to notice. If you're going to a website or a social media service and you're trying to load a video you, you know tests that were happening last night or here's a video of my really cute cat and the video is not loading you don't necessarily know is that uh because the website isn't working or is it because deeper into the stack your isp or your ac your access provider has decided that's too much data to transmit over the network right now or we're not sure about the copyright behind that video and so we're just going to make sure that it kind of never loads for you um, but it also interferes with people understanding just what's happening to them online but also trying to advocate for things like to engage in um, that kind of selective delivery of content and i think copy access providers have been a big source of a lot of some of the kind of legal proposals at least um, about i guess 10 years ago we had the the big fight around the sopa pipa laws um, name system 
in the service of uh, controlling access to infringing an enormous debate in the US and, and really got attention from around the world because it was just squarely interests um, in the copyright industry wanting to find ways to ensure that their rights and their freedom <clears throat> created potential security issues and vulnerabilities, um, created si significant privatizing this mechanism of using the domain name system as a way to decide that <clears throat> but entire domains um, could be kind of yanked from circulation, uh, you know, through illegal ultimately defeated. But we've also seen things like, again, this was about 10 years ago, um, the government was looking at a way to basically give people um, notices and uh, using their internet access, you know, at home or at school or at a business um, to engage in copyright laws around um, kind of requiring internet service providers to uh, by default filter by and large, uh, but and not kind of alleging that the, the information is per se illegal for any access, but on, on grounds of concerns about child protection, wanting to have the default be that people cannot call their ISP to say, please unblock these websites so that I can access them. That has some pretty obvious potential chilling me access to the pornography, um, but it's it's another example of how um, some different uh, regulators and legislators are looking at how can they leverage different parts of the stack, especially this concept of network level filtering for the people kind of at the endpoints who are actually putting that content online um, and who could be more directly. Next question is going to be about um, uh, you know the key design principles of the open internet, but since you mentioned those, so let me turn it over to you, Corinne, if you've got something there that you'd like to add. Yeah, so I just, you know, the, the blocking will often be overbroad. We've talked a little bit about is that let's say you had all the notice in the world um do you have a choice do you have any um and depending on the kind of service that you're talking about it may be that and, and this is why um net neutrality is often you know a very compelling argument for many people is because in many in many places around the world if your um service provider if your isp chooses to block x y and z site or to term chooses to intervene based on content you can't vote with your feet as we say you can't you, and so i think that's a that's an important part of this is for most users there's not a lot you can do about it other than maybe try to make noise or as and the content which most people are probably not going to do um or or there might be a situation where you know we've got sort of amazon and users um in a lot of uh, from because of their particular interpretation of u.s sanctation and so aws um is cutting off um many iranian users well they don't but there's a competition problem here because there are some um companies that have make are tremendously influential and for many users they may not be in a position where they can sort of be able to or um so again it's, it's not just notice it's also like what can you do about it beyond the platform layer your options may be quite limited that's a fantastic point and actually i would love to just throw one question that just came to mind at all of you um has the pandemic exacerbated any of this do you think um are there examples specifically from the past few years that we should be concerned Well, one that I think about is educate for um, education and for um, and for conf video services. And I think that um, at that it, there's a way in which these kinds of things, but it's also true that some of them, you know, are more more or less where um, um, where Zoom and YouTube have made the speakers to use their services. This is also based on, I think, a flawed interpretation um, from private parties. And um, and so as a result of that, you know, as a practical matter, it means that, um, again, I think that Zoom would think of itself as more of a platform than as, a, than as something that's in the stack, but on a conferencing uh, service, you know, that feels pretty critical, at least you know, what kinds of speech they're going to allow via their service. I mean, sort of it make the beyond.
on this conference call, I think we would think that was pretty problematic and, and, and unacceptable. Um, and to me in the pandemic, you know, the choices that, um, that Zoom makes, for example, about what content it's gonna host or not, you know, is, is essentially the same thing. Thank you, no, that's really helpful. And it sounds like a lot of this possible are identifying content moderation uh, mistakes organizations can be monitoring this in public face intermediaries. Um, it's, it's quite hard when, when those platforms are interfered from your tribe. What, what if your are are there and you're alone uh, facing or so, yeah. Uh, to face the, the the intermediary or the state that is behind the intermediary because let's be honest this happens a lot no thank you for that i mean you've all made a very compelling case here and i'm i'm recognizing that we're getting close to the 20 minute marker and we've got a couple of things to share but i do want to ask one final question before we share something what what are your recommendations significant risks and concerns, and there there are very many, but I do think we have to acknowledge that, and as I think a couple of people have posted in the chat already, um, they making at least ad hoc decisions or case-by-case -case decisions um, and intervening in different ways uh, and, and kind of um, taking action. The elephant in the room, I think, is Cloudflare and um, all the recent actions that they've taken um, against Kiwi Farms, um, the uh, just 
really horrible website that was filled with a lot of um, really virulently anti-trans uh, and other hateful material. Um, and it was the focus of an enormous campaign from a lot of activists um, kind of around the world to say that you know this website is so incredibly toxic, it shouldn't be available to anyone anywhere on the web um, and Cloudflare should intervene based on arms. So, you know, Cloudflare took action there and I think there's, you know, you can understand why, um, why a service like that would also intervene in their own sort of leeway to make these decisions and to de develop things that are effectively content policies or turn line um, and or just something that they don't want to associate their company with. Um, when that happens, I think kind of the recommendations around transparency and like prior notice to users. There's a big risk in any kind of content moderation, let alone the infrastructure content kind of system or that kind of policy for any company is really vulnerable to abuse. It's vulnerable to being really kind of leveraged by um, government actors or pulled or consistent or predictable to users who maybe are trying to decide what kind of infamy throughout the stack that is thinking about taking interventions against content to actually before doing so or before those moments of crisis where they're facing some really strong pressure from a government or a really um, vocal and passionate advocacy campaign from people uh, to have thought through the kind of the lines that something you know a site or service might cross um, articulate those articulate them when the time comes it's not a kind of rushed and ad hoc decision um, but that there's actually some just taking action against some websites or some content for for un and that the the ratchet of censorship only ever turns in one direction um, and that those, those same intermediaries again for all the reasons we described um, would probably end up having really significant impacts absolutely so consistency is key and i think you know from my observation we've certainly seen more trans examples than we have around some of the other examples from elsewhere in the world. Uh, Augustina, Corinne, is there anything you'd like to add there? Otherwise, but final final thoughts from all um, three of you. Really. Could I, Jillian, could I come in on this qu question oh, yeah, about you? So yeah, I've been largely quiet. I think you've all made a really good case for why this is so important. But I think in terms of what um, matters a lot is even after the decision, which I think is where a lot of your um, the panel focuses on. I think there are good ways to do this because um, I think one of the things we want to avoid is like the collateral damage to the internet um, or to situations outside the current jurisdiction that you know aren't actually part of the all um, RFC. This is an IETF document um, and so on that is um, focused around like technical considerations for actually how to do it. So you know all down through the network um, in a very helpful but pretty densely technical actually just try to help companies understand like okay you've decided you're going to block something here's the best way in the least perhaps if it were a, there was a bridging document or some kind of translation effort pinnacle document they could also help governments make the right decision when uh, not, you know create a situation in which um, companies are forced to overblock or you know, should be brought into the discussion. Because whether or not we agree again with the decision making around if something should, or a malware or things that companies are definitely blocking and we want them to continue blocking, um, means, which which I would agree with, but, um, but nonetheless, that could be potentially. In the chat as well, so yeah, for people in the room who don't have the chat link, it's RFC 77. I appreciate it. I apologize for missing your hand there. Um, are there any quick closing thoughts from Okay, excellent. Well, there will be time for closing thoughts. Oh, sorry, did you have a hand? I apologize. Closing, closing thoughts.
thoughts at the end of the Q&A. Um, so what has this been leading up to? Well, we do have something to share with you today. Um, and that is a website, a civil society statement. Um, I'm dropping it in the chat now. Um, that a number of us have worked on over the past year, including a number of others who could not be here with us today, either in person or virtually, um, but whose country not putting that pressure on PAC to take down content. So just to flesh out a little bit more what we're what we're doing in the Q and A, because I totally would love to talk to the audience. Not not at all. Thank you very much for for elaborating further on that. I and it looks you can't get to the link from there. Do we have any questions in chat as well? Yep, there's a question out here. Go ahead. Um, story. Um, I think uh, it was two months ago or something on the um, shop in Japan and the uh, MasterCard, uh, they don't, uh, they uh, start not accepting it that the uh, MasterCard think uh, they are selling child porn. manga or anime are often misinterpreted as child pornography, which is not as al already many panelists uh notice uh when religious escar or um, i might say western centric the form of content moderation it's a really big problem and uh, also uh, blocking or uh, circumvention of payment uh, regulation um uh, remember that the cryptocurrency uh, is originally devices like uh, cj dns or uh, other stuff so our amount of people only use them is because they are inconvenient. Technologies uh, uh, will be very developed and uh, easy to learn it. Um, you can do that, but uh, maybe uh, will uh, uh, flourish. Thank you very much. I think uh, EFF just recently became aware of that case, and I believe uh, my recollection is that it's users that are uh, potentially um, uh, making these demands upon uh, Japanese on the broader comment here. Um, I, just to chime in and say a particular example, but unfortunately it doesn't surprise me. Um, we've seen a lot of this under the banner of calling it child pornography or saying that it's sex trafficking. Um, and we've seen that kind of target US and in other jurisdictions around the world. So it's also, I think, a really important, you know, uh,
a campaign like Protect the Stack, um, we we need to realize that they are facing some of some of the same intermediaries like a Mastercard or a Visa are facing pressures from so many different jurisdictions all at once, and that we also need to be really kind of coordinated as civil society to even understand what are all of these different um, campaigns or pressures or things. Because oh, and sorry, one. more addition to that. Um, if so, what form would that take and how would the multi-stakeholder community get involved? Yeah, I'm, I'm also, I'm happy to chime in on this one. Um, and Izan, I think that's a really important question and one that is really good to discuss. It's something like collectively, I think it was over a dozen different DNS providers um, kind of talking through what their policies and practices and sort of standards are and when they might intervene and when they don't. And my understanding was that that was developed as a like industry or DNS service only conversation. I, mean, I don't actually know how much com uh, consultation there was, but it wasn't the kind of like broadly public, multi-stakeholder, um, you know, totally out in the open kind of conversation that, that I think you're sort of alluding to in your comment. Um, and th this is not necessarily a critique of that framework, um, but just to note that I think it, it reflects that that segment of the infrastructure community realized that they themselves needed and wanted some, some guidelines and some structures and some policies to follow. And so they went and they made some for themselves. And that's really understandable. But, you know, I, I agree with Izan's question that, um, you know, if if these kinds of standards are going to be developed, having them done in a multi-stakeholder fashion where we can actually really think through all of these different kinds of examples, all of the different scenarios and situations that are happening in so many different parts of the world, what kinds of pressures are more relevant to different parts of infrastructure providers? Is it social pressure? Is it financial pressure from, say, advertisers that don't want you to process their payments if you're also processing payments for this other website? Is it um, government pressure primarily? Though getting all of that content um, best achieved through an um, open multi-stakeholder process. So it is sort of why it's particularly difficult is that, um, you know, really, if you're going, if you have civil society, you've got to figure out how to make that participation meaningful and influential, and how are you going to pay level. Um, one of the things that um, that we've seen is that, and one of the reasons that um, I'm very excited about the Protect the Stack statement is because it's it's um, signed, signed onto by so many international groups, so people outside of the United States, outside of the EU, sort of the majority world countries, um, civil society from, from those, it, um, representatives from from those regions, because they experience the um, these kinds of interventions differently, and so you need, so really a, a full multi stakeholder process involves getting a lot of different kinds of voices, and as we all know, or as many of us know, you know, getting that kind of civil society participation isn't easy because people are busy and they can't afford it, or you know they don't have the resources necessarily to, to participate in 
endless or what feels like endless <laughs> multi-stakeholder processes. Um, ICANN in particular can be very, very challenging for civil society to, to engage with. Um, so I think part of what we need is like a, a real commitment to having one where like civil society can genuinely be influential. So we don't feel like it's what would be to push to just don't do those interventions as opposed to trying to have a frame in the difficulty of having that kind of multi-stakeholder communication. Uh, we have a question in the room and then I also want to put my, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, my name is Raul Plummer uh, with uh, Electronic Front. They started interesting me the Japanese case of, of the uh, fiction. Uh, when should MasterCard uh, ban uh, or stop uh, if there are many countries that are, are finding it illegal? And there's a good list of the point that, that MasterCard can do this where it is okay to do so. get us started. Um, I think that, you know, if if a company is um, in a position where it's difficult to, to do something other than obey the order from a court, um, and but I think the, the particular concern that that I have anyway um, is, is not so much when they're doing it in response to a, a, an actual order. I mean, that has its own problems, but at least hopefully there's a court overseeing something. Um, it's when, um, but it's when companies are are taking these steps, sort of um, more subtle pressure. Uh, it, I think it, at, at a minimum, the firemen to intervene as opposed to doing so voluntarily. Um, it, like that, that seems to me to be so. Your guys appears to be lawful content. And I'll just chime in with uh, to point folks to one restriction network um, has tackled a version of this question in trying to look at sort of against content that have cross-border implications and trying to identify, you know, are there areas where there's enough sort of what kind of content is illegal um, and or should be prohibited. And, and I can say from having areas where there's, there really feels like there's global consensus that such few areas, but I think what we're seeing here in this, this um, question of the, or there are areas where there's less consensus, for example, around um, illustrations that don't actually this question is difficult enough when we're talking about it at the content moderation and sort of application layer of when forbidden worldwide. Um, and I think that ability to find that considering the potential impacts of those decisions have potentially even broader ramifications. So I think it's a, it's a very difficult um, line to try to. Thank you, Emma and Mallory. I know that you had a question as well. I'm also aware of time, but you're in the room, so you can let us know. Similar to the previous question, which is, you know, do you feel like there needs to be more of a line user generated content versus the kinds of interventions where it's a DNS abuse framework is that those are contracts. I mean, you are ha you have a contract, not have that contract anymore. And then there, you know, and also it goes for like advertising versus user generated posts or where there's a contract, there is some legal um, arrangement. And I do feel like they're definitely agree your framework uh, makes sense for um, the latter case. Um. I think it's a. I think I think your question of scale, from a freedom of expression point of view, um, what a, a lot of times processors or other companies that are higher in the stack are are doing is basically uh, blocking content based on a prior judgment that, that content doesn't conform to a certain rule, um, and. If we look at it from a contractual perspective, content, um, basically, um, and you should be looking for illegal content only and not necessarily this category of harmful but, but legal kinds of categories, which are really a lot of the from companies taking the initiative to do this thing. It's, it's con content that it's harmful, but it's presumably legal content that, uh, that they are taking down. And, the question, the question from a freedom of expression point of view is who's better suited to make that
judgment and who's better suited to offer a proportional and necessary response um, to, to reparation response sanction. And I, I think most of the cases that we cited point to um, the next couple of years will be for, for these self-regulations uh, to, to make concrete recommendations for states on how much I think we have to close out in the room anyway, but Julian, I'll let you actually close the panel since it's um, This was fantastic. And to everyone uh, who asked a question or participated in some way, we hope that you check out the site. Feel free to share it.